Zach Lokes. I'm an award-winning grower and the author of the Permaculture Market Garden. And this video series is part of a series on food security. And it's going to focus on the permabed system, which is outlined in my book, The Permaculture Market Garden. And it's what I use here on the farm and at other homestead sites across the country. The permabed system is just like it sounds. It's a system for permanent raised garden beds. Now, whereas a lot of times garden beds are made with wood siding or other sorts of containers, the permabed system is all made out of soil. Every raised bed has soil. It's made by raising the soil about eight to 12 inches above the grade of your garden plot. And you do this by taking a shovel and digging a line along your garden and piling that soil into the middle and then measuring about four feet in and piling the soil again to the middle. So you're able to create a bed that is four feet from the center of the path to the center of the path with a raised area in between. Now, in order to understand how to go from grass to this garden soil, in case you have uh, no garden plot already and you want to start from scratch, the best thing to do, I find, is to start with your grass lawn in the spring and cover it with a piece of poly tarp. Uh, this is the type of tarp that is often found at feed stores or farm supply stores that are used to cover large stacks of hay. So if you research um, farm supply in your area, they will often have sheets that are about 100 by 25 or 100 by 30. Um, and this can be used to do an entire garden plot, or it could be cut into pieces and you can split the cost with neighbors. So if you weigh this down over the grass for the full season, it'll completely fry your grass down. If you want to get a jump quicker on your garden beds, you can leave it down for uh, a month maybe and um, get it quite fried and then form your beds and then you can continue to fry it with the raised beds themselves. So again, with the permabed system, we're talking about raised garden beds that are made from soil. Now, it's not just soil. It can be soil and compost, um, and it can have other micronutrients and amendments added in order to improve the fertility uh, for vegetables uh, or perennials like berry bushes, fruit trees, and nut trees. One of the other large differences with the permabed system compared to other raised bed systems is that these beds are never moved. They're never uh, destroyed at the end of the year. Larger market gardens will often um, plow or till all of their garden beds in at the end of the year um, and then cover crop the whole field if they're an organic farm. Uh, and sometimes in the home garden, we see this as well. So in this case, these beds always stay exactly where they are in the field. So if you had a series of beds, like say these three here, um, they're always gonna be at that exact location. The beds will be reformed from time to time by, by applying more material from the paths to the surface, and they can be re-loosened over time uh, using a broad fork, for instance. And you can rake the surfaces and re-prepare them, but there's no longer any deep tillage. This means that you have a soil life zone in here. And the soil life is so critical for the productivity of your garden. So I use this spiral here to, to um, denote soil life. So once you go from grass and you're able to kill off the grass and have soil, you can apply a compost layer right on top, and then you can begin to work it into the soil with a broad fork. And the broad fork is simply a, a large digging fork that is able to dig down into the soil and um, cause it to subsoil to loosen down deep. And then you're able to uh, dig and pile and build your raised bed. And you can do a pr bed preparation on the top with a garden rake. Um, I have a couple garden articles up on hobbyfarm.com. Uh, and so you can see these about some of the essential tools uh, that I'm talking about. And there is going to be a continued stream of these articles um, twice a month about some of the essential tools and garden practices uh, that I use and that are part of the permabed system. So once we build a raised bed, 
Another aspect of the permabed system is the fact that the garden beds themselves are designed to be a framework for integrating diversity into your garden. We often talk about garden companions, about companionship planting, and part of the permabed system is to maximize companionship planting, to make it so it's easier for us to integrate different types of plants within a garden set of beds for maximum benefit. So part of what the permabeds do is because they are set in place and they have a permanent place in space, we're able to actually understand relationships over time between different beds and design guilds, that's companionships of plants, usually three or more plants that work together, uh, within the framework of the garden beds. So the first thing is to know that a permabed has a neighbor. That's the bed that's adjacent to it. So we have this bed here and we have its neighbor over here and they have relationships between them that go back and forth. And then the next thing to understand is that in most permaplots or garden plots, you're gonna have more than one neighbor. So you might have the bed in the middle and you might have the bed on the side. Now this three bed section is called a triad in the permabed system. Again, outlined in the book, The Permaculture Market Garden. So the triad is a three bed section, one, two, and three, a center bed, and two neighboring beds or two outer beds. And this three bed section, this triad becomes the unit for guild design. Any garden guild, whether it's with annual vegetables or herbs or with perennial fruits, berries, and nuts is designed in the permabed system around a three bed unit. This maximizes efficiency because we're able to think about all of the crops that we want to grow, whether annuals like vegetables or perennials like fruit trees, in terms of a unit of management. We are no longer thinking about the individual, but we're thinking about the collective, but we assign certain values so that we think about a limited number of guilds. So you may start to design uh, three different annual vegetable guilds in your garden and you plant the main or key species of your annual vegetable guild here, we'll call it A, and you might plant a companionship species here, we'll call it B, and another companionship species here, and we'll call it C. So this ABC configuration using the triad of three garden beds is actually a specific type of guild, which we could call it CAB, just because of the letters we've assigned here, but we're able to actually understand that this guild that we've designed is able to be used on any three beds within the, the garden plot, and we can now manage it as a unit. So any time in my crop rotation or any time when I'm growing vegetables, I plant these three together as a guild unit. And I may only have, say, six or 12 annual vegetable guilds that I use. I'm gonna go into more detail on guild design in another video, but suffice to say that by using the permabed system and by designing around a three bed unit of management, I'm able to have a lot of space, time, energy savings, as well as maximizing the potential benefits of these plants for each other. An example of that, which I like to give because it's a very straightforward example, is imagine the key plant here is squash. Now squash needs to be planted in my area in, in uh, northeastern Ontario around the end of May. This is when we start to have the last frost, sometime between May 24th and it can go, you know, even uh, into June. So the squash needs to be planted then. However, squash will take up a lot of space. Eventually, it's going to spread all the way over into bed two and over here into this neighbor in bed three. But in the meantime, are these beds just going to be empty beds that I have to weed with my hoe in order to keep the weeds down before the squash spreads? Or am I able to maximize that space time through a way of partitioning it using other crops? In this case, for B, I'm going to put in some radish because radish will go really early in the spring. I can actually seed them outside uh, as soon as the ground is starting to be uh, free of snow and the soil's warmed up a little bit. So that could be as early as April 1st for me here, uh, but maybe more generally mid-April. 
And especially if I cover it with a, a piece of floating row cover, I can get extra boost from it. So I'll plant my radishes here in this bed as a companionship. And another early crop that I can seed at the same time that is managed in a similar way would be a salad green. Both the salad green and the radish can go into the ground quite early, and both would benefit from being covered by a floating row cover in order to maximize their capacity to be, um, to maximize their ability to, to grow well in the early spring months. It maintains moisture um, and keeps heat in around them. So both of these are gonna go in, let's say, uh, mid-April. And with this extra productive force from the row cover, they're gonna be harvested out in about 30 days, right around the time when this squash is going to be seeded in. So already, even if I decide to get a couple extra cuts from the salad, which I can, and even if these lag a little more behind the radishes in a colder spring, I still have a big window of opportunity. Meanwhile, the squash here is gonna get transplanted in and I like to tuck a piece of weed barrier up next to the squash. Now this would be a piece of weed barrier that is the, the width of the bed, a full bed, but actually I like to do it a two width bed. And I like to take the one on one side and one on the other and then roll up the extra in the path. So I put this here, I plant my squash uh, in between these. These can be ground stapled into the ground or weighed down with um, some extra garden soil. And um, now the squash is growing. And as the squash starts to spread, these crops are now no longer in here. However, I can leave them a little bit longer uh, just to become a bit of a green manure. The scraggly radish that never really produced, I can leave them in for a little longer and there'll be little weeds coming up but none of them have gone to seed yet. Same with the lettuce. Maybe I've taken two cuts of lettuce as a cut and come technique, which uh, we'll talk about in another video. And now that it's starting to grow up uh, and becoming a bit of a green manure, meaning it's building organic matter, it's um, uh, fixing uh, nutrients from the subsoil, bringing them up into the, the organic material. It's a green manure, but as soon as the squash needs the space, we remember this bit of row cover, uh, this bit of weed barrier we put on each side, which is rolled up in the path, keeping a nice weed-free path and nice heat units for the squash because they love that extra heat that the weed barrier provides. And so at this time, I simply mow down any more of the debris. It could be a handheld weed whacker, or I don't even have to, and I can pull this over and cover it here, and same here. And now I weigh it down. I have grown a, a crop of radish and a green manure. I've grown a crop of salad and had green manure benefits from it as well. All of that is nutrients that are now gonna be provided to the squash as it, as it asks for more and more food. I have a completely weed-free environment here with the use of the weed barrier. And the squash now is gonna to start to sprawl and it'll cover right over both of these beds going in both directions. This is a space of somewhere between uh, 15 to maybe 18 feet, depending on the scale of your garden. And uh, it could even be less actually, sorry. It could be 12 feet if you're doing the four foot section. My garden beds are a little bit bigger here on the farm. So 12 feet to 18 feet and this is sprawling over all these beds, completely weed free. The squash is producing, it has lots of water under there. Believe it or not, they love growing over top of the weed barrier. It keeps the squash clean. Um, all of this uh, green manure under here is now rapidly decomposing from the extra heat of the weed barrier into the ground, feeding the soil life because these are perma beds and being transported over here to the squash plant. So we see a lot of benefit going on. But then the guild design goes further. It understands that we wanna maximize the use of our various uh, supplies on the farm or in the home garden. So I wanna use this weed barrier somewhere else as well. Yes, I've used it already and had one function by protecting the young squash and keeping it weed free. That's awesome. I have a second function of now protecting and keeping weed free the squash as it sprawls over these two beds. That's awesome. I had a third function because it actually fried down the little rogue weeds that came up in my salad patch and in my, my um, radish patch. And it's taking all the green manure and it's frying it down and making those nutrients available to the squash. So that's a, a third function. Um, and now I'm able to actually pull this out because instead of actually putting a hole into one weed barrier and planting the squash through it, 
Remember, I have two pieces of weed barrier here that butt up in line with the squash. So I can actually pull them out from either side of the squash before the squash start to get too heavy, um, just slide them out. And now the squash can rest on a completely weed-free soil. And even if some weed seeds germinate in there, squash is actually a great cover crop. It has big, broad leaves. It takes over a space. However, this design model helps defeat squash's number one weed enemy for your overall garden success. And that's that, that is that if the weed gets established in your squash patch early on, in say June or July, it will never be able to be weeded because it'll be hard to get to it. And they tend to grow up, lambs, quarter, and other weeds, and become large towering weeds that disperse hundreds of thousands of seeds and make big weed bombs, as it's called, where you have a big patch in your garden with tons of seeds from a weed germinating. They all come from one plant and it causes a big weed bloom. So using this technique, you get all these benefits, but also you prevent weed bombs because by the time you pull the weed barrier out, the squash is gonna prevent any of those large uh, lambs, lambs quarter or pigweed or other um, weeds from, from getting away in the squash patch where you can't get at them. And now these weed barriers can be used in another part of the garden um, for another job so you've had multiple functions. So this is some of the aspects of the permabed system, how to create it from scratch, from grass, killing it off with a poly tarp, and then reforming and rebuilding a raised bed, uh, building it initially and then reforming it using compost. Beds have neighbors, which allow relationships. Three beds make the triad, which allows a maximum use of the space, the time, and the energy needed to produce your garden. And it allows you to have multiple benefits uh, with different plants working together and to be able to think of that as a management guild. And now you go, all right, my guild is squash and radish and lettuce. And then I'm able to maximize this guild and plant it somewhere else. Perhaps we'll call this guild over here, the curcubit guild, because that's what it's called uh, in the book, The Permaculture Market Dog Garden. I just call it the Kirk guild or the curcubit guild, because what's important to realize here is that this could be any curcubit. This could be a melon, this could be a zucchini, this could be a winter squash. This doesn't necessarily have to have a radish. These could be summer, uh, spring turnips, excuse me, or this could be arugula. This over here could be spinach. It's actually allowing you to have a way of thinking about and organizing where like crops that are managed in a similar way can combine with other crops that are managed in a similar way as a guild unit. And now any sort of mixture uh, is managed in the same way. The next time you could do a zucchini and a spring turnip and spinach and you manage it in the same way, it's the same guild. So again, in the Permaculture Mark Garden, I lay out uh, my six main guilds at the back of the book, uh, as well as the entire permabed system. Uh, if you're looking for more information or find out more about edible ecosystem design, you can check out my website uh, at zachlokes.com. That's Z-A-C-H-L-O-E-K-S.com. And stay tuned for more mini videos as I start to um, put some more together uh, for this spring 2020. Let's make it a good one.